Facebook pages. So thank you for our friends and partners across the state who are live streaming this through Facebook. Um, when we are, are we ready to launch the poll? Okay, so let us know a little bit about who you are out there um, and by filling out the poll, just um, what sector, um, professional sector are you joining us from today and listening in on? Okay, we'll give everyone, all right. I just launched the poll, so we'll give everyone a few minutes. Uh, and while we're waiting for that, uh, again, we are recording. And, and if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, hover your cursor over the bottom part of your screen and you will see uh, different functions there. You are all muted for the duration of the session until it's time for the question and answer session. Um, and uh, we'll use our chat function if you want to uh, post a question into the chat that we will ask our speakers. We will, we have four speakers today, so it's action packed. Uh, we have Janice Kearns, Eric Sass, Christina Cookley from Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and Lauren Kinsman Costello from Kent State University talking to us about wetlands today. Um, and so if you have a question, they're going to speak all the way through uh, for 30 to 40 minutes and we'll be taking chat questions when they are finished and opening up for uh, the Q&A session. Um, okay, we are about 80% of our poll is, um, is completed. I wanted to let you know that this webinar series is brought to you by the All Ohio Chapter of the Soil and Water Conservation Society and our partners. Um, you can visit uh, our website and learn more about our society. Uh, we'll post that link to our website in the chat. Please consider becoming a member. And also we're soliciting nominations to uh, sit, serve on our board and our committee for 2021. So if you're interested in our organization, like the work we do, want to bring more programming like this to the state of Ohio, please consider running uh, to be on our board. And you'll find more information about membership on our website and how to join our board. Uh, we are also supported today by members of the Nature Conservancy. They are uh, helping us in the background to run our Facebook live streams and uh, help manage our chat boxes. So I wanna thank uh, the staff from the Nature Conservancy for joining us today. Um, okay, so we're just about reaching the end of our polling. We're at about 86%. It's almost like an election night, right? So <laughs> I think we're gonna get all the votes in though at one time. Um, and so, so far we've got a uh, majority of folks are joining us from government agencies today. Uh, we have university researchers, NGOs. Oh good, a nice uh, um, set of students are with us, wetland designers and engineers and uh, general other categories. So we have a nice diversity of participants on the call today. Um, so I'm gonna end the poll right there and uh, turn it over to Janice Kearns and we are gonna get started. Excellent, I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, are you seeing everything right? Oh, there we go. Does that look good to you? Yes, looks great. I can see your intro slide. Excellent. Um, so yeah, like she said, I am Janice Kearns. I am the reserve manager at Old Woman Creek National Estuarine Research Reserve. I am also um, part of the H2 Ohio ODNR team, uh, the lead individual um, trying to organize the monitoring program with the assistance of some of the people here on this call um, or on this webinar. So Eric Sass is the H2 Ohio program manager for Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And Christina Cookley, who is also be talking today, is the Northwest Regional Scenic River Manager through the Department of Natural Areas and Preserves. And then Dr. Lauren Kinsman Costello is also joining us. She's the Assistant Professor at the Department of Biology at Kent State University. She is also the lead researcher for our monitoring program through LEARN, which she will tell you about a little bit later. 
So with that, the outline for today is going to be uh, jam-packed with each of us talking a little bit about some background information about the goals of H2 Ohio and how they relate to the work that the ODNR is doing uh, for the purposes of wetland nutrient removal, as well as Christina will be giving some ex specific examples of some of the work that's already on the ground for wetland restoration. And then Lauren will be talking about the components of the wetland monitoring program, some of the decision-making processes and the development of that program and where we hope to go. I'll then finish up with uh, some brief discussions about how we plan to use that information going forward and future research opportunities and how we'll be translating all of this information back to people a lot like yourselves. So whether you're managers, academics, students, um, how will we get all of this information to all of you uh, once we have some of it collected? So with that, I will uh, hand it off to Eric Sass to give you some background information. Thanks, Janice. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us today. I'm Eric Sass. I'm the H2 Ohio Program Manager at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, sort of the background, the context of the uh, wetland work that we're doing through H2 Ohio at ODNR these days. Um, so you know, here in Ohio, as we see this slide, uh, you know, like many other places, we face water quality issues related to the cultural eutrophication of our surface waters. Um, you know, it's, it's too many nutrients and it stems from uh, how we're using the landscape. Uh, and, and we see this problem come to a head, unfortunately, every summer. To some degree or another, we have uh, these harmful algae blooms in our streams, rivers, or lakes, uh, rendering them uh, from a recreational standpoint unattractive or from a public health standpoint inaccessible or even toxic. And this can't go on. Next slide, please. So an incredible amount of effort and resources, frankly, have been directed toward the successful uh, management and reduction of pollution from industrial and municipal point sources in recent decades in Ohio. Uh, much of that credit goes to our partners uh, at the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency and the, the ongoing work that they do. Now, in terms of, of non-point source pollution, uh, H2 Ohio represents a commitment from Ohio Governor Mike DeWine and Ohio legislature to bring resources to bear to attack our non-point source, uh, sources of pollution and uh, also address several other important water quality initiatives. So H2 Ohio really at its core is a powerful collaboration. Uh, it's an alignment of mission across state agencies as well as industry agriculture and conservation organizations to fix our water quality problems. So back to non-point source um, and addressing that, uh, our sister agency at the Ohio Department of Agri Agriculture is working hard on water quality, uh, incentivizers, incentivizing producers to use practices that reduce nutrient export from a working landscape. And the Ohio EPA is helping track our progress on a landscape scale. Next slide. So at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, we're tapping our expertise and our extensive network of conservation partners to deploy a, a natural infrastructure-based approach, an ecosystem restoration-based approach to improving water quality. A variety of modeling and research-based approaches indicate that creating, restoring, or enhancing wetlands, reconnecting floodplains, these can all be part of a cost-effective approach to reducing nutrient loading from the landscape. And that'll reduce nutrient loading to downstream water bodies like Lake Erie or our inland lakes or large rivers. Furthermore, with this approach, there's the promise of lasting impacts, uh, the, these ecosystems delivering their services year after year. And our focus with wetlands uh, at ODNR through our H2 Ohio program, it's, it's a little bit different uh, than maybe typical uh, wetland restoration or creation approaches. Uh, we're really focused on prioritizing projects that have a strong nutrient reduction component foremost. And that's by locating these projects in places on the landscape that have a high amount of nutrient export 
and in situations where they can intercept a lot of surface water. So, you know, this, this actually um, lists as, as co-benefits uh, all these other things that, that are typically what drive uh, ecosystem uh, creation or restoration uh, in terms of wetlands. Uh, we acknowledge that the wetlands also have carbon sequestration, sequestration benefits. Um, they restore natural hydrologic regimes, um, groundwater recharge, peak flow attenuation, habitat for threatened and endangered species. But what we're really looking for is the nutrient reduction benefit of these systems. And in, in doing so, you know, we understand that there is some temporal or situational variability in the performance of these systems in that regard. So that's why we've set aside 10% uh, of our implementation funding to stand up a, uh, a monitoring program to provide adaptive management feedback on the performance of these wetlands. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that here in a little bit later in our presentation, but we're proud to be working with uh, the LEARN network uh, for that monitoring program. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our ODNR team um, has set forth carefully and thoughtfully and frankly with a high degree of urgency to move projects from conceptual design to implementation on the landscape. So our phase one H2 Ohio projects, as you see here, uh, are, are dots on the map. Uh, we have 26 projects that are moving forward right now. Uh, involving over 3,500 acres of wetlands that are either uh, newly created, restored, reconnected, or enhanced, incorporating uh, over 60,000 acres of drainage uh, in, a, in a largely agricultural landscape. You can see our geographic focus is the Maumee River watershed and the Western Lake Erie Basin. Uh, we do additionally have a few projects uh, in our um, southern part of the state that drains uh, southward to the Ohio River. Um, those are uh, situated upstream of some of our inland lakes that have experienced HAB issues in recent years. And we're proud to be working with uh, over a dozen uh, conservation partners to implement this project work. Um, this involves anyone from the Nature Conservancy to the Black Swamp Conservancy, Ducks Unlimited, a whole variety of soil and water conservation districts and uh, county and municipal uh, park districts. And we view this as a long-term approach. Um, this is phase one. We're already working on phase two. We're starting to talk about phase three. Uh, and, and we have a, a lot more of this coming. We, we view our uh, program as that long-term approach and not necessarily just a funding mechanism. So um, with that, uh, let's, let's shift over to Christina and she can uh, zoom in on a couple of these dots for us and tell us about this project work. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Eric. Um, so yes, my name is Christina Cookley, and I am fortunate enough to be one of the field staff that has an implementation role with some of these specific H2 Ohio projects. Uh, so the first one I'm going to describe for you is the fruit wetland restoration. This took place in Seneca County in our partner was the Seneca County Park District, did an excellent job managing this project. This was our first H2 Ohio project to go in the ground. This was completed on July, um, well, it was completed in the month of July 2020. And this was one of our smaller H2 Ohio projects. The total cost of this project was $309,000. And that included some land acquisition and it also included the restoration. The wetland restoration for this H2 Ohio project was a total of seven acres. And as Eric mentioned, we're designing these wetland restorations and choosing these projects based on treatment of other nutrient rich waters throughout the watershed. So this is a seven acre wetland that should be treating drainage from about 50 acres of agricultural property. So this is one of our smaller wetland projects, gonna, but it's gonna be interesting to see how this smaller scale measures up and its nutrient reduction effectiveness compared to larger scale projects. Um, 
the original covering of this landscape was just a soccer field and it was very intensively drained because the soils in this area possessed hydric characteristics throughout. Um, so that tile was removed, the soil became ripped, and as you can see in the picture in the right hand corner of the slide, ultimately in the wetland, the wetland's bottom is not going to be flat. It's got different hills and hammocks inside of the wetland boundary to help promote uh, different plants and vegetation that could grow throughout the wetland as water comes in and out of this system. So this was a very exciting project and it's going to be treating waters that will ultimately go to the Wolf Creek tributary to the Sandusky State Scenic River. Okay, next slide, please. Yep, here's a nice overview image of the Seneca County Park project. So you may have seen in the conceptual design of that first slide, there was a green area. Um, which was the main seven acre wetland restoration. There were some additional enhancements that were done in a woodlot, which is on the left side of this image, but mainly in the center focal point of this aerial image here, um, that little green polygon you can see is on the landscape and in place. So now we're just waiting for that site to vegetate up. Um, I think it's going to be seeded a little bit next spring, but it's going to be very exciting to see how this wetland does. Next slide, please, Janice. Okay, now we're moving to another H2 Ohio project. I'm happy to report that this one is also currently in the ground, constructed, seeded. Um, it, we've got it. Um, so this is the St. Joseph Confluence Project. Our partner on this was the Black Swamp Conservancy District. Uh, the Black Swamp Conservancy did an excellent job managing this project. Um, the total grant award for this project was $730,000. And this was a situation where all of that grant award money went specifically to just the restoration itself. So if you look on the right hand portion of this slide, you can see the conceptual design for the project and there's an outline of a red polygon on that conceptual design. Uh, that red polygon shows the total acreage of the property we were working on. Uh, it was a total of 140 acres and the Black Swamp Conservancy was able to work with our partners at Ohio EPA through the WRRSP program, which is the Water Resource Restoration Sponsor Program to acquire this 140 acres. And so in this acquisition, they were already protecting some outstanding category three wetlands. And this property was also noted for containing good habitat for the copper-bellied water snake, which is a federally endangered snake. Um, so we already had some good things going with this property and the pot got sweetened a little bit with what we could do through H2 Ohio for this. So also, if you look at this conceptual map, you can see that there are some little blue lines on this map indicating the St. Joseph River in the south and then in the upper right hand corner you can see the west branch of the St. Joseph, the east branch of the St. Joseph, and then also some other unnamed tributaries that come together. So this was basically a confluence area. We've got multiple streams coming together and so that means we were able to restore floodplain wetlands in this area that had great potential for intercepting nutrient rich and sediment laden waters from higher up in the watershed. So we've estimated that the drainage area that will be coming through this property is about 1.3 square miles of drainage. And it's going to be going through about 30 acres of restored floodplain wetland. Um, so this property was a really great opportunity because we had all these streams and in some cases we were able to remove dikes um, from the west branch of the St. Joseph River in this area to really allow it to utilize that floodplain to a much higher degree than it was before. Um, it, was, it was a really spectacular project and as you can see on the left side of this slide, this was a picture I took in early of October 
uh, where EnviroScience, our director, Mary Mertz, and Eric Soss and the Black Swamp Conservancy, we were all able to go look and see some of the finished construction. So this uh, picture was taken kind of in this uh, field on the north corner of the property. So if you look at the concept map, there's the big green blob in the upper portion of the concept plan. We were basically standing up in that area overlooking into the floodplain, the new floodplain that had just been carved out. And a lot of these floodplain wetlands, are, they weren't excavated very deep. They're excavated about six to 12 inches in places. Um, but that should really help with a lot of flood water retention. And I should note too, um, on the concept plans, the fields that are marked out in green where we restored the wetlands, these fields were either CRP initially, or they were row crop fields where we were able to go and do this work. All right. I think it's back to you, Janice. Yep. So yeah, thank you guys both. Um, so we have, um, there's been a lot of research over uh, the last 30 or 40 years on wetlands and understanding how they work. Um, but as many of you in the audience know that there's still a lot of information that we don't know. Um, Within the projects uh, that have already been uh, developed, there's a diversity, um, the ones that are developed for the H2O Ohio wetland projects, there's a large diversity from ones that are, are more natural looking to uh, highly managed systems like treatment trains that are in discussion uh, of either improving um, or, or creating. And so, we want to know some new information about how do we uh, select new sites? Um, how do we manage sites that are already existing to improve um, their nutrient um, management capacity? And so we have a lot of different questions. We're on the edge of science, as Lauren likes to say, in this regards. Um, and so we have developed a monitoring program or currently developing a monitoring program to ask some really critical questions. Uh, and specifically compared to other uh, wetland monitoring programs, our specific goal is nutrient reduction. And so we want to know, are these wetland restorations a cost-effective method for mitigating nutrient loads to water bodies in Ohio? And then how, does it, how can we manage these effectively going forward? And so that are the critical questions that we hope that this monitoring program will be uh, focusing in on. So I will now switch this over to Lauren and she'll tell you a little bit more about the monitoring program. Thanks, Janice. Uh, it's great to see you all. Um, next slide, please. So most of you, if you're logging into a webinar about working wetlands, I'm sure you've heard the phrase the kid that wetlands are the kidneys of the landscape because of their natural ability to filter various forms of pollution, including nutrients. Um, this is by and large true, it's generally the case, but many of you, most of you probably also know the fact that the actual capacity of individual wetlands to remove pollutants and pollutants of different kinds uh, can vary uh, from site to site and even over time in an individual site. Um, and part of that has to do with some of the just inherent differences between the chemical nature of nitrogen and phosphorus. So a system that's really effective at nitrogen removal might not simultaneously be as effective at phosphorus removal and vice versa. We know that both of these nutrients are really important for playing roles in contributing to harmful algal blooms. And then finally, uh, next slide please. We also know that many wetlands, many wetlands on which restoration activities occur were formerly drained agricultural land, and that many of those lands carry this legacy of altered hydrology and fertilizer use that at times can lead to these wetlands becoming a source rather than a sink for phosphorus. So this is uh, data on soluble reactive phosphorus, which is the available form of phosphorus that algae can use, um, measured in the surface water of a wetland that was restored by reflooding historically drained agricultural cultural land in Southeast Michigan that I studied for my dissertation. And you'll, you'll see that immediately after this red dashed line, which is when 
the wetland reflooded um, as part of this restoration, some of the concentrations of phosphate that we measured were extraordinarily high in the hundreds of micrograms per liter, which most limnologists would call for sure a hypereutrophic system. Um, and, and evidence led us to conclude that this phosphorus was coming from the soils within the system. So we, this is a known challenge in using wetlands in landscapes throughout many areas of Ohio for wetland restoration. It's part of the reason we're um, designing the monitoring program the way that we are. Next slide, please. So most traditional um, programs that are designed to monitor and assess wetlands for their status or their health or usually for regulatory purposes, including, for example, the Ohio Rapid assess Assessment Method are necessarily based on easily observable, directly measurable features like plant communities, plant diversity, substrate characteristics, the size of the system. Um, and these, these programs often assume that these invisible nutrient cycling functions are occurring as intended based on the structural features of the wetland. So sometimes this is referred to as the, if we build it, they will come mentality um, in terms of wetland implementation for water quality improvement, which um, is uh, appropriate, especially when you're considering the entire suite of co-benefits that a wetland can provide. And your main interest is increasing the acreages of high quality wetlands on the landscape, but in this situation, we're specifically interested in the goal of limiting nutrients to potentially vulnerable systems, systems that are vulnerable to eutrophication. Next slide, please. So for the H2 Ohio Wetland Monitoring Program, our goal is to directly assess um, these nutrient removal functions by making them visible and directly measuring them as best we can. Next. So to do this, the ODNR is engaged with this uh, group called LEARN, the Lake Erie Aquatic and, and Aquatic Research Network. This is a broad network of over 50 researchers throughout Ohio and the Lake Erie watershed that is growing. Next slide, please. And within LEARN, we've assembled a wetland and aquatic research team specifically to contribute to drafting and implementing this monitoring program. Uh, you'll see it's made up of university researchers um, from six universities throughout the state of Ohio. Um, it's basically a dream team of wetland ecologists and biogeochemists and soil scientists and hydrologists um, and soil geophysicists and, and um, everybody who we thought could contribute substantially substantially to creating a really scientifically robust and implementable monitoring program for this large suite of wetland projects. Next slide, please. Okay, so how are we actually going to do this? How do you assess wetland nutrient removal function? The most straightforward, if not the easiest way, is sometimes referred to as the mass balance approach, and it's basically budgeting, measuring everything that goes into a system, Everything that comes out of the system and assessing, is there less going out than coming in? What's the balance of that ecosystem for whatever specific pollutant or nutrient you're interested in? Next. So I like to provide this example of the Oldman Creek wetland, which I sometimes refer to as the poster child, a poster child of Great Lakes wetlands. Um, and this, we're fortunate in this wetland to have a constrained inflow and outflow where we can directly measure the concentration of a nutrient of interest in water. We can measure how much of that water is entering the wetland or leaving the wetland. And by doing some simple arithmetic, we end up with a load, right? The total mass of that nutrient that is entering the system, the total mass of that nutrient that's leaving the system. Next. 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 So if we subtract that outflow load from the inflow load, we end up with a mass balance. Next. If that value is positive, right, means there's more going in than coming out. This is what we typically want for nutrients. And we end up with a mass of that nutrient like nitrogen or phosphorus that's removed. And we can consider that ecosystem to be a sink for that nutrient. Next, please. If that value is negative, which happens at times, um, then that's a value of that massive nutrient that was released from the system. And that system may be a net source for that nutrient. Next. 
Once we're able to calculate this vast balance, then it becomes really straightforward to do things like translating the uh, amount or the pounds of a nutrient removed by a system um, in a cost benefit way. For example, you could divide the pounds of phosphorus removed in a given year by a wetland by the cost of that project um, and end up with a value of, for example, pounds phosphorus removed per dollar. And then this can become one piece of information that can contribute to cost benefit analyses for various kinds of wetland projects, various kinds of wetland management, and other forms of BMPs and interventions that are being applied in various ways um, throughout the landscape to address nutrient problems. Next. There are a couple caveats to ensure accuracy of these numbers, um, right? Uh, one limitation is being able to sample all of the major inputs and outputs. So if you're missing any of those, you might be missing a large part of the mass balance. Um, and you need sufficient temporal resolution to capture what biogeochemists and ecosystem ecologists sometimes refer to as hot moments. So I like this example of the graph on the right, which is a time series for the 2017 water year at the Oldman Creek inflow. Um, you can see the top panel is showing the volume of water that's entering the system, the discharge. Um, the middle panel shows the suspended solids concentration in the surface water measured daily throughout this year. And then when we multiply those two together, we get a daily load. Um, and you can see next that if there are a couple of days here, a series of days that if you were to, for example, come to the system and take a sample once a month, or once a season instead of once a day, you could vastly underestimate or misrepresent the net effect of this system. Um, so although doing this kind of mass balance approach is, it's very labor intensive, it's very sampling intensive, it's equipment intensive, it's analytically intensive, um, but it gives us a very solid assessment of the actual nutrient removal function of an entire ecosystem. And for a flow through system, it's relatively straightforward. Even though it's um, costly, we know how to do it. Next. So a flow through wetland is one we kind of define as having a limited quantity of constrained unidirectional flows that are easily monitorable. Now, if you have dove into any of these projects on the list, of the phase one H2 Ohio projects, you'll note that they are not all characterized as flow through wetlands. Next. Some are coastal wetland projects, which have a combination of these kinds of constrained flows, but also have uh, connections to Lake Erie, often which result in bi-directional flow, especially due to the uh, issue of sage effects from the lake. Um, and then the hydrology of these systems is not only based on an inflow and an outflow, but it's based on Great Lakes water levels, seiches, and direct management of the water level by ecosystem managers. Next. Um, many of these sites could be best characterized as floodplain wetlands, where it's a wetland that's adjacent to a large river or some kind of large flow, um, where you could imagine taking water samples from that river, um, and even though the wetland may be influencing the nutrient concentrations in that surface water, um, they, the, that effect might not be detectable simply because of the size of that river and how it's integrating a much larger landscape. Next. Finally, many sites are uh, so-called isolated sites, geographically isolated, not truly isolated from the landscape, but isolated in the sense that they don't have any constrained inflows and outflows. They may be mostly fed by distributed unconstrained inputs like just surface runoff. Um, and many of these have um, difficult to characterize interactions with groundwater that may be playing a really important role in the inputs and outputs from the system. Next. So because it's not as straightforward to do an entire nutrient budget for these hydrologically complex systems, we are combining the traditional surface water sampling nutrient budgeting approach with soil scale nutrient budgeting approaches um, uh, to create sort of a suite of nutrient removal measurements. Um, and we're adapting these techniques as is needed based on the hydrology of each individual site. 
Um, and this is the point where this program is a little bit at the at what I like to call the edge of the science. Um, and this is the part that makes me and the other researchers that are on this team really excited about being involved in developing this monitoring program. Um, because we think it's going to create some really interesting baseline understanding of how wetland ecosystems work in addition to the direct goal of assessing the value of these systems. Uh, in terms of their cost benefit and directing future decision making. Now, as an asterisk here, you'll notice we're taking a tiered approach. We recognize that it would be logistically infeasible to do a complete and total intensive nutrient budget mass balance at every single one of the 26 and more to come sites. Um, and so our plan is to distribute indicator measurements that are logistically feasible and will provide things like red flags um, for any detrimental effects like phosphorus release throughout all of the implemented sites. And we're gonna select a few focal sites to intensively monitor um, and provide the kind of mechanistic information that can inform predictions of future site behavior and um, decisions about future site uh, location and management. Next. The other thing, especially in these intensively monitor sites, is that we are going to open up the biogeochemical black box. So we recognize that when you just measure an inflow and an outflow and you do a nutrient budget, you're essentially putting that wetland in a black box. Me as a scientist and the other researchers on the team definitely want to know more than that. And we know that knowing more than that is going to um, get us a lot further in informing future decisions. Next. So whenever possible, next. We're baking into our monitoring protocols, soil characterization, vegetation mapping and nutrient content, spatially explicit hydrologic monitor modeling, um, and many other data sets that are going to contribute to not only the answer to the question of does this system remove nutrients or not, but how does each system remove nutrients next. So the framework for the plan, the document that we're actually drafting, um, consists of sort of a, a background and an overview, which outlines the motivation and the rationale between the decisions that we've made about how to implement this monitoring, um, some sort of guiding principles for how best to assess nutrient removal in these vastly different kinds of wetlands, um, and then a set of specific universal consistent protocols that will be used to develop site specific monitoring plans for each project and all of this will be nested within an adaptive framework. Um, next. So how are we going to adapt these standardized protocols, uh, so a protocol for say how to go take a soil sample, um, to each of these sort of very unique individual project sites. Um, and the way we're going to do that is to adaptively develop site specific monitoring plans following consistent guidelines that we lay out in this plan. Next. So at each site, we're going to start with sort of a rapid characterization, boots on the ground visit, and we'll have design plans and preliminary data that will help us guide our first season of sampling. Um, and throughout that first season for every site, we're also going to implement a detailed set of site characterization protocols, including soil geophysics, vegetation patches, topographic and bathymetric surveys, and groundwater mapping that will help us understand the hydrology of the site, um, and also some soil characterization and water quality analysis. Next. We're going to take that information together to develop a site specific plan and this plan is going to include things like maps of where to take soil samples, where to take water samples, how frequently, and it's going to refer to the protocols that are relevant to that specific site because we recognize that not all approaches are going to be effective and necessary and resource effective at every site. Next. And then we're going to every year based on the routine monitoring from the previous years, um, update these site specific plans as our understanding of the sites changes and as the site itself changes as we recognize that all these systems are not going to stay exactly the same throughout time. Next. In order to actually implement this plan, 
uh, which is a pretty large scope based on the number of projects. No single researcher or single research lab could handle all of these soil samples and all of these water samples um, and all of the different kinds of techniques that we plan to implement. So that's one of the benefits of leveraging this research network as the field sampling and lab analyses are going to be distributed among the LEARN members and institutions based on geography, capacity, expertise, and logistics. Next. And finally, this is a picture of where we're at. We're currently polishing off the draft of the, of the first draft of the monitoring plan. We're gonna send it out to some advisors for um, critical review. We're hoping to finalize the plan in February and get our boots on the ground sampling these brand new wetland sites in March. And we hope to share some preliminary lessons learned in September um, and then um, in the winter. And these are things we plan to do every year going forward. We will um, in, have deep conversations with agency representatives from the ODNR and other relevant agencies and the on the ground partners to update our plan um, to best adapt the monitoring as the situations change at each site. And I'll hand it back off to Janice now to talk about the research opportunities that this data will open up. Yep. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. So uh, as you might imagine, as uh, both Lauren and I pointed out, that we are truly at the edge of science uh, for wetland science here. And so we, our goal, or our hope, I should say, is, is that we can use this monitoring uh, program as a platform in which we can bounce additional research projects off of. Um, so go beyond the scope of this project and ask a, a additional questions about biodiversity, about habitat, uh, and also testing out new technologies. There's lots of new sensors out there, lots of new ways that these sensors are communicating uh, with each other and to us. Um, and so this monitoring program will have a vast amount of information over a large landscape. Um, and then we hope to um, then find additional funding outside uh, of H2OIO in which to do answer research questions. And specifically things that will help us move forward in the future about understanding the mechanistic uh, or functions within wetland restoration projects to make them successful. Um, how, to, how do we can, compare different kinds of management goals. And so our management goals are for, for nutrient reductions, but a lot of wetlands out there are managed for habitat and wildlife purposes. And, and do those different management purposes compete or do they come together and you can get the best of both worlds? We don't know all of those questions. And of course, there's lots of questions about the uh, role of legacy prosperous, especially on many of these agricultural lands. And so, there's just a lot of questions that we hope to use this monitoring program as a foundation where we can seek out additional funding um, to answer these questions. And so once we have a few answers to these questions, along with the, the monitoring data, um, which will answer our specific questions. Um, Old Woman Creek, the National Estuary Research Reserve System, and the ODNR uh, both really want to, we're always trying to collect research information, monitoring information, and then transferring that information to the people that need it. And so whether it's like people like you in the audience, whether you work for the government or within academia or students young in your career, we we want to produce products uh, and, and events that will then take this information and show you exactly what we've learned and how we are utilizing our resources wisely. And so Lauren um, had alluded to in the timeline, we do uh, expect to have uh, an annual webinar where we will discuss this information. So we have our initial webinar, which will be right, a year from now, just kind of talking about the on the ground foundations of what we've been able to do and then in future years, additional information that we've gained over time. Uh, and through that process, we hope to uh, work with all of our collaborators to get additional feedback um, from them and then be able to provide information back to them as well. 
So with that, I would like to thank all of you for, for being here. I see that we have at least 90 plus people in the audience, as well as those who might be live streaming on different media sources. Uh, so I really thank any the questions you have uh, for us now. And I'll hand it back over to Jessica and Erin. Okay, thank you speakers. That was excellent. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come into the chat. The first maybe is more of a clarification and I'm gonna direct it at Lauren and maybe add to it. So uh, with the work Heidelberg College has done, uh, why weren't they included or are they included in the Learn Network? And maybe you can state for people that might not have video, the institutions that are involved in the Learn Network. Absolutely. Um... So the broader LEARN network um, includes representatives, to my knowledge, of most of the universities and research institutions in Ohio. Um, the specific group that is writing this monitoring plan is what we call the Wetlands and Aquatic Research Group. Um, and Laura Johnson, who's the director of the National Center for Water Quality Research at Heidelberg, is a member of that group. So she is a really important um, contributor to this monitoring plan because of their vast experience and it's like it can't overstate the value of the monitoring that they do um, and so yeah they had to be at the table 100 percent okay thank you and there's a follow-up for you lauren um, how long will these sites be monitored a few years or indefinitely that's a really good question. I'll reflect what my ODNR agency um, people tell me, which is that we we're absolutely 100% committed um, to monitoring them right now for three years. And the intention is that that will continue for, I think, at least 10 years and I hope longer. Excellent, excellent. Um, okay, we have another follow up question. This uh, can be for any one of the group or all of you can chime in. With climate change a reality, how will this affect your wetland projects? That is an excellent question. Uh, I mean, climate change is already affecting the projects. It, it will continue to affect them. And that's why we are baking in the kind of flexibility into the monitoring plan that we do right now. Because not only is each Wetlands are inherently really hydrologically variable compared to a stream or a lake. And climate change is only gonna make them even more variable. There's gonna be times when a site is flooded and under two meters of water in that same site in a different spot or at a different time, maybe totally dry. And that's one of the challenges to writing a monitoring plan for each of these projects is, um, but we're walking into it prepared to assess the wetlands under that kind of variability. Okay, Janice, Eric, or Christina, do you wanna have any thoughts? I can just add, you know, we already have a, uh, uh, a great understanding of the importance of that question at Owen Creek. Um, you know, just a few years ago before the lake levels increased, um, you know, we had a very different landscape than we do now. Um, and now uh, most of our um, estuary is fully um, underwater. Um, a, you know, a foot of water exists where there was actual land before and and, and regular land. Um, and so designing a sampling where you want to get vegetation information and soil information and the techniques to get that soil um, in the same location uh, year after year when you have no idea whether it's going to be, you know, full of maybe um, yeah, highly dense vegetation or completely flooded underwater uh, with no vegetation. Um, and so it, it is something that we are uh, knowingly going into and planning as well as we possibly can, so. Okay, great. Um, where can our participants find a website or a location where the project wetlands are listed that have been funded by H2 Ohio. Is there a good website we can direct our participants to to learn more? 
Yeah, that's uh, h2.ohio.gov slash natural dash resources. Um, you, can, you can find our, our project list there. Um, we have, we're in the process of updating our, our website at the moment. So there's, there's a few projects that we uh, have included in, in phase one that may not be listed there currently. Um, something we're working on behind the scenes here. Okay, and let's make sure that we get that website into the chat so people can see it and click on it. Thank you. Um, okay, another question. Uh, is there a reason the sites are concentrated in Northwest Ohio, aside from the loss of the Great Black Swamp? So a little bit more on the decision making and prioritization. Yeah, I think that gets at the uh, program priorities uh, for H2 Ohio. Um, you know, we are working in concert with the Ohio Department of Agriculture and we're re really leading with uh, the nutrient uh, loading issue into the western basin of Lake Erie. Um, that's in alignment with Ohio's domestic action plan. Um, but we also recognize that certainly there are uh, water quality issues in other parts of the state. And, and we, we intend uh, to increase the impact of H2 Ohio uh, on more of a statewide basis as we move forward. Um, at ODNR, we have a, a few projects uh, outside of the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, it's certainly not the bulk of our focus right now, but we intend uh, in future phases uh, to include more project work uh, in the Ohio River drainage and in the Central Basin. Okay. Uh, Eric, don't go away. We've got a question for you about altered hydrology and ag land use, um, leading to wetlands becoming a source of nutrients. Does this suggest that these compromised altered quote, wetlands were a sink until they reached premature capacity to impacts from hydrology. So when and where are we concerned that these wetlands could be sources versus sinks and when might that happen? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, uh, it's certainly a possibility. I, I think we, we acknowledge that. Um, you know, we're, we're working to uh, make sure that when or if that happens, we're on top of it and we can circle back in an adaptive management framework um, to, to make that system work the way we want it to. Um, and then also to prioritize uh, future project work that, that works uh, you know, without as much uh, management required. Um, you know, in, in Northwest Ohio, there's a lot of um, ongoing uh, ditch maintenance. Uh, you know, that, that's part of the, the altered hydrology of that landscape. Um, we have a, a couple examples of uh, future project work that's going to uh, create hopefully a win-win out of some of these uh, drainage projects where uh, we want to be able to facilitate that drainage uh, for, for production, but also generate a, a water quality benefit at the same time. So uh, we have a couple examples uh, of that uh, that we're, we're looking to highlight in our, our phase two H2 Ohio. Okay, excellent. You're oh. very clairvoyant today. That was a follow-up question was, could, the, could some of your resources be used to include some of the ditch maintenance and headwater streams and ditches? Could I just Certainly. follow up um, yeah. answer to that? So in terms of the risk of restored wetlands becoming sources of phosphorus, one of the great opportunities of this program, the suite of projects and this monitoring program being implemented in the way it is, is that it gives us a really unique opportunity to validate some different techniques that are in development to predict whether or not a site will release phosphorus, because sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and we don't have a great way of making that kind of prediction to inform site selection. There's different things in development and we're implementing those measurements where we can to help inform those future decisions. And I'll also add, um, that's why we are also, I think everyone from uh, me on up to the director are really focusing on wanting this to be a long-term monitoring program so that, you know, if there is short-term uh, increases that we can also document what the long-term um, look looks like. Great, thank you. Along those lines, potentially, uh, this may be a question for Lauren. Uh, which SONs or equipment are you using to monitor the SRP? Thank you for your great work. 
Um, we are still in the process of selecting the specific sensors and SANS that we will be using throughout the program. We have no plans at the moment to use a sensor to measure SRP. This provides a good opportunity if there are emerging technologies that will give us data at the detection limits and precision that we need to test those emerging technologies. But we plan on using direct chemical measurements of the concentrations of different forms of phosphorus in surface waters and soils to create these data. And we'll supplement those with sensors for things like dissolved oxygen and conductivity and pH and things like that where it's um, where we can do it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, it looks like we do have the link to the H2 Ohio uh, website where the wetland projects are listed in the chat now. So you can use that hyperlink. Thank you, Aaron, for putting that in there. Uh, do we have any other questions for our panels? We have about, just about five minutes left. Okay, here's a question coming in. Uh, will you use monitoring wells to document seasonal high water levels at your sites? Yes. We're gonna use a, a, a suite of different techniques to monitor water levels and water level changes throughout the, site, the sites and wells are one of them. I should add that our intention after we draft this plan will be to make it available so it can inform monitoring efforts in the state of Ohio and generally, um, you know, and we're gonna be open to conversations about sharing what we learn as we go with other efforts um, and learning from others. So if, if there are people on this call who've implemented a program like this before, please, we welcome your feedback. <laughs> welcome it heartily. <laughs> Yeah, that is an additional goal that we have is that once this program is in development, anybody doing restoration uh, as well can use the protocols that we have so that we can compare across those. So it's it's more than just H2 Ohio and the ODNR that it can be used by uh, multiple uh, institutions or agencies. Great. Well, I want to thank all of our speakers today. Uh, it was really informative. It's great to see the work. There was one more question. It came directly to me, but I think it's oh, okay. better for Eric to answer it. Okay, go ahead. Um, this was from K.N. Messer. Um, Eric, the question to me was, they're curious to learn how our projects were selected and if there are any planned opportunities for projects in Central Ohio and P2 or P3, I'm assuming they mean phase two or phase three. Yes, yeah, so our, our projects are, are selected, you know, based on a, a geographic priority, uh, firstly. Um, but you know, as, as I indicated, there is uh, potential for, for projects in central Ohio and, and northeast Ohio, uh, where, where we really haven't had a lot of uh, presence yet. Um, it really depends on, uh, you know, future allocations, uh, you know, for this work and uh, how we can bring in additional funding uh, to, the, to support our program. Uh, we want this to be a full statewide effort here uh, over the next few years. Okay, thank you. And with that, if we get any more questions coming to the chat, all of the speakers or from Facebook, all of the speakers have agreed to uh, receive those questions afterwards and uh, answer them. Again, this is being recorded. So we will make the recording available to those of you who want to visit it again, see the resources or share it with some of your partners and friends. Uh, in the chat, you'll see that we have an evaluation, a short evaluation form for this event. Please let us know uh, what you liked about the event, what more information you'd want to hear on future events, and how. And we have one more uh, Working Wetlands presentation to give uh, in December, so just about a month away. We're going to follow up on this and learn more about some of the long-term science uh, from one of our partners monitoring wetlands out in Illinois. Um, so I just wanted to thank all of the speakers for your time today and the great information and the work you're doing to bring more wetlands to the state of Ohio. 
Um, and in the chat, we also have a link to the Working Wetlands Part 3 registration link if you have not signed up for that already. Please don't forget to visit the Ohio Soil and Water Conservation Society website. Consider a membership. Uh, our society also uh, gives a $1,000 college scholarship to a student pursuing a degree in natural resources and soil and water conservation. So uh, membership and donations to the organization help to provide those scholarships to students. Um, so again, we're right at time. We really appreciate everyone for tuning in and all of your great questions. And we'll see you again next month for part three. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you.